Welcome back to Take 5 Friday, where we talk the people and process behind making and maintaining the U.S. diplomatic presence around the world. This week, Division Chief at OBO, Rob Jeter, is talking with Bruce Fadre, Vice President and Director of International Programs at Mason & Hanger. Mason & Hanger is one of the oldest architecture and engineering firms in the nation, founded in Richmond, Virginia in 1827. They have completed projects in 48 states and 165 countries. In his role, Bruce is responsible for the management of the firm's international business development and extensive portfolio of international projects and has been involved with projects in 53 countries, which have a combined construction value in excess of $12 billion. Bruce served for almost 10 years with the Bureau of Overseas Buildings Operations as the division chief over the Near East Asia and South Central Asia region. In his position, he led a project management team responsible for the department's projects covering the U.S. embassies and consulates located in the 29 countries that make up the region. He also served as a project manager and design manager during his time at OBO. Rob Jeter is a registered professional civil engineer at OBO and serves as a senior project manager in the Office of Project Development and Coordination. He has over 24 years of experience in large land development projects and water resources management, both in private sector consulting firms and with the Department of State. Mr. Jeter has spent the past seven years with the Office of Project Development and Coordination, South and Central Asia Area Division, serving as project manager on projects in Lahore, Pakistan, Dhaka, Bangladesh, and India. We're very excited to have them both with us today. Welcome. All right, well, welcome today, to, uh, Bruce Fadre from Mason and Hanger um, to our Take Five Fridays. Um, this is a great opportunity to get together with our colleagues in the industry and to hear about kind of what makes their excitement in our, in our work. Um, so uh, one of the questions that we have is just kind of how you got into architecture and then how did that translate into working with the State Department? Uh, sure, but if you don't mind, first, let me just say thanks, Rob, for, for having me today. It's a real great honor to, to be included in the, uh, in the cadre of folks that you guys have interviewed here for Take Five Fridays. It's, uh, it's kind of cool to have been on both sides, to have been right. internal and now external and, and see how everything you know, works together. So uh, hopefully it can bring a little bit of that flavor to our talk today. But, uh, you know, I mean... <laughs> Becoming an architect was a childhood dream for me. Um, I grew up in a construction family. Uh, my dad was a carpenter and a, and a builder, as was his father before him. So I had uncles and, and granduncles and cousins who were carpenters and, and masons and electricians and plumbers. And it just, it was a family thing, right, growing up. Um, so I just literally grew up on job sites. Um, when I was in the fifth grade, my dad, uh, was building a, a junior high next to the grade school that I attended. So school's out, I'm on the job site, you know, shadowing dad around, uh, probably being more of a, uh, a problem and, a, <laughs> and an obstacle than anything else. But <laughs> Helping. You know, yeah, but it, it gave me a lot of uh, real growing up insight, you know, and, into what all these people were doing on this site and, and how buildings went together. Um, I took all the technical drawing classes I could take, you know, in junior high and high school. And, and uh, actually, uh, I remember clearly in high school uh, on a Christmas break out working on one of my dad's job sites, um, trying to stay warm by a fire and a five gallon metal paint bucket, which will <laughs> tell you somewhat how long ago that was. Um, <laughs> And this guy pulls up on the job site, nice car, nice clothes, gets out, walks around, tells her buddy, you know, kind of what to do, gets back in his car, leave. Dad, who's that guy? Oh, that's the architect. Oh, yeah, yeah, I want to be that guy. I want to be that guy. Uh, and as it turned out, I got to meet the gentleman. Uh, and he was he was really great, helped mentor me, encouraged me, you know, to, to really follow my dream to get into school and uh, even... Uh, 
had the privilege of designing and, and seeing constructed my first office building while I was still in high school, which was for my dad's construction company. So um, that was kind of set my path. Uh, when I got to college, uh, I laughingly say I, I crammed my five-year architectural degree into 13 and a half years. Uh, <laughs> you, know, <So> you, familiar. <laughs> you, you work your way through school, you have a family and uh, just life gets in the way and uh, you'd work a little bit, make enough money for tuition, go to school, be broke, do it all over again. Um, it's really uh, insightful when uh, you realize the incoming freshman class was all in kindergarten when you started college. Oh my. It's a real motivator to get out. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, once, once I did, um, I passed my uh, architectural exams the first, first time I took them and the, the goal was achieved, you know, of, of being an architect. And then that just kind of launched the career from there. So. Yeah, absolutely. I know that I started out in architecture as well. Uh, and uh, after that first year, I decided, uh, while I loved all the board drafting, the, um, uh, the freehand perspective wasn't quite for me. So I kind of went the other end of the spectrum and went into engineering and, and, uh, and finished in, uh, in five years, as they, as they say. So, um, but no, I'm right there with you. I understand. Um, did you have a, a, a path to the State Department that was, that was um, notable? Well, it, yeah, it, it kind of developed over a bit of time, you know, again, kind of been blessed to work both inside and outside of state. But uh, back in uh, kind of 1995 to 2002 timeframe, I had my own firm in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. um, did a lot of medical design build work, um, you know, some custom residential stuff, a little commercial office work. Um, but during that time, I really became interested in doing some projects overseas. Uh, my, my church was really active in doing a lot of overseas missions kind of work. And um, I got to do some um, church medical facility type work in Guyana and in Cambodia and Thailand. And in 2002, I was approached about going to Thailand and overseeing a, a renovation project of a hospital outside of Bangkok. And um, it really intrigued me. Uh, I actually closed my practice down in Oklahoma City. And uh, we uh, moved to Thailand and uh, spent three and a half years wow. there working for a faith-based NGO, uh, doing housing and dormitories and hospitals and schools and, and different things. Um, concurrently with that, I worked as the uh, assistant dean for international affairs at Chiang Mai University and was a, I guess, lecturer, worked with, you know, third year design studio kids and thesis kids and, and just really, you know, got a tremendous amount of joy out of just doing that. And then uh, all everybody might remember the day after Christmas in 2004 had the, the big Asian tsunami that just wiped out parts of uh, Indonesia, Thailand, even all the way over into Sri Lanka and uh, ended up directing all of the Southern Baptist relief work uh, in South Thailand, uh, working in 13 displaced person camps, you know, delivering food six days a week and rebuilding houses in one village and fishing boats for another village and building schools and, and doing things to put people back to work. Um, and that really, you know, that was just really inspiring work. But um, as things come to an end, uh, you know, so did that work. And uh, I saw an ad for the State Department advertising for some architecture positions. That sounded like really good. And it dug a little into OBO and its mission, found that exciting. Um, so I applied, got a very lovely rejection letter saying that I was well qualified, but not selected. <laughs> and uh, then about two weeks later, out of the blue, I got a call from Patrick Collins, who was then the uh, chief architect for the State Department, saying he'd seen my resume, really liked it. Uh, sorry, couldn't offer me a direct hire position, but did I know what a personal service contract or a PSC position was, which I had no clue, but he explained it, asked me if I wanted one. I said, sure, sign me up. I need, I need something to go do. And uh, that started my uh, 
started my work and then in with the state department so yeah you know I, I i find that inspiration and that mission of the state department something that really drew me in and i and i hear that for for you too that the that really when you start to get out in the world and work in in places um, that you never put on your that you never put on your bucket list for travel, so to speak, you know that um, there's a lot of meaning in the work that we do, and it's very very inspiring. So um, you know you, you moved uh, on to working and uh, representing Mason Hanger. Um, can you give us a um, just an idea of what kind of challenges that you've had, whether um, at OBO or now now in your new role? In leading the Mason Hanger effort. Well, sure. Um, it, you know, I, a lot of folks just don't realize. I mean, almost every single project that OBO undertakes or or that we support as contractors, um, we work in some areas where literally every piece of building material that goes into that facility has to arrive on that site in a shipping container. I mean, you know, we've even done that in some places where you couldn't even use the local aggregates to make concrete. It's uh, that, that's always a huge challenge trying to figure that out and, and figure out the logistics of every project. But, you know, the one project that just has stands out heads and tails above all the others is that uh, new embassy compound in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was asked as as an architect at the time to lead a team of subject matter experts to the site to get the compound commissioned and opened running, you know, get the, get the certificate of occupancy uh, issued uh, so folks could move into it out of the uh, Republican palace there in Baghdad. And uh, the team landed in, in Baghdad on the Thursday before Easter Sunday in 2008. And uh, very early Easter Sunday morning at 5.45 in the morning, I was, rudely awakened when a Katusha rocket took out a warehouse about a hundred feet from where I was sleeping in a, uh, in a chew or a containerized housing unit. Um, really think garden shed with a cot in it, uh, you know, kind of a thing. And um, over the next week, man, you know, over 200 rockets and mortars landed in the, in the green zone in the vicinity of the palace and the new embassy compound. So it really ticked up the notch, you know, of uh, mm -hmm. for people to want to get into that that new secure compound. And um, the team worked feverishly over the course of know, three or four weeks uh, trying to get all of the life safety systems, the mechanical systems, everything working so we could, you know, issue a CFO for the for the project. Yeah. And through all of that, you know, just really gained a, a super uh, appreciation for the work that OBO does, for how critical it is uh, for the diplomats who are trying to carry out the, the mission of the U.S. government, you know, to have a safe, secure environment to work in. Um, yeah. You know, it, it's hard enough, as you know, to get new facilities open and commissioned and running uh, without the added benefit of uh, rocket mortar fire raining down upon you. So that's, Absolutely. that's by far got to be the biggest challenge. Yeah. I know one of the things that you and I connected on is, is going to Afghanistan and, and working on the, the, uh, all the construction that we had in safe and secure facilities to be building there, whether it was the residential facilities or the embassy or, or even some of the, uh, the facilities for our support staff. And yeah, I just remember that like getting people in safe, secure facilities was so, so important. And it was such a driving factor that inspires us as employees of, of OBO and, and, and the contractors that work with us are so, so important to getting the job done. It's, it's that we really appreciate everybody who has the same mindset as, as you do that that we are out there and we're, we're, we're trying our darndest to get people in safe, secure facilities. It really is, it, it, it's, it's amazing. And I, I guess I, I just wanna thank you for, for doing that and being a part of that, that big mission with us. It's, it's been a lot of fun, it really has. Absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Take Five Friday. We hope you'll join us again next week. See you then.